Our scripture this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. The reading of the gospel is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, and this from the New Living Translation. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, look. I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray once again. Creator God, we pray that you will cause the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together to be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. To start today's message focusing on peace and the topic peace at last just a couple of words maybe you'll find humorous maybe not so it's a little exchange between a disciple and the master and the disciple said oh wise and all-knowing one take me to the realm of perfect peace 
The master replied, if I take you to that realm, it will no longer be peaceful. Maybe the same can be said of so many encounters that we have and so many wishes that we share. Perhaps you are familiar with the saying, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. So the first no is N-O, where there is no Jesus. There is no peace. The second no is K-N-O-W, but if we know Jesus, we will know peace. Isn't the English language just one funny thing? Notwithstanding, the argument is not settled. There is still trouble everywhere. And perhaps that's where that little story about the disciple and the master takes its form. Where the disciple desires to go to a place of peace. And the master replied, if I take you there, there will no longer be any peace. Over the years, I've had many a conversations with persons in different churches, from different parts. And one of the things I hear persons say many times, I want to find a really good church where there is no conflict, no problems, where everybody is just wonderful. And oftentimes my response will be, well, when you get there, it will no longer be like that. Because the church is a place where Jesus calls all and sundry to come and to share in his peace. We find the peace of Jesus when we surrender ourselves to Jesus. When we cause Jesus to reign on the throne of our hearts. When we allow Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit to direct our thoughts, to direct our speech, and to direct our actions. So the Jews in the time of Jesus wrestled with the question, is Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah? Mind you, the wrestling continues today, not only among Jews, but also among many others across the world, even within the church itself. The Messiah is the anointed one who was prophesied to come by the prophets of old. For the Jews, their peace would have come through the promised Messiah who would have come and push back the tyrannic rule of the Roman Empire from which they longed for deliverance from their oppression. So consequently, Jesus of Nazareth did not fulfill that expectation of the Jews as the promised Prince of Peace, since he did not lead a revolt against the Romans. For this reason, the argument continues around the question, did Jesus fail in his mission to rule as the Prince of Peace? My simple answer is, no, he did not. The word for peace in Hebrew is rendered shalom, which translates to mean completeness or soundness or welfare or tranquility or contentment or friendship. We can take any one of those words when we hear the word peace as it was rendered in its Hebrew form. And according to this understanding, peace is a state of being. Peace is a state of being. 
There is also the understanding that peace is the absence of or the freedom from war, strife, and conflict. And should both schools of thought be combined, it can be safely assumed that peace is both internal and external, which makes it personal and corporate. We struggle with these thoughts. And we struggle with these ideas. Both Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel skip the birth narrative of Jesus. But in Luke chapter 2 and verse 14, the angels declared to the shepherds that the coming of Jesus is the coming of peace. And so Luke 2, 14 reads, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to all people on whom God's favor rests. There were several instances as well where Jesus himself spoke of the peace that he offers to the world. For the Christian person, therefore, the argument is settled because of the evidence of God's word. The Christian person knows that he or she has peace both internally and externally. The rest that Jesus promises to give to anyone who follows him is respite in the soul when the struggles of this life that exact such an awful cost from us seem unending. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This promise that Jesus makes is not to be understood to mean that anyone who comes to him will not struggle and suffer. Instead, the promise of Jesus is to be understood as meaning that in the face of adversity, there is security. The rest that Jesus promises is manifested in his peace that comes to us through his word and the Holy Spirit giving us calm and strength in the midst of tragedy. The Christian person has to struggle and will struggle because it is in the midst of struggle that we come to know the peace and the power of God. And so the Apostle Paul speaks of the peace of God as the peace that passes all understanding. This is where the well-known saying I mentioned earlier on about knowing Jesus means knowing peace, has its merit because unlike anyone or any who know not the peace of Christ, the redeemed of the Lord are able to stand still in the midst of adversity because they know that the salvation of the Lord is near. Let me trouble you for a little bit. Has any one of you ever been in trouble? And I'm not talking some simple trouble where it's a maybe that calamity will strike. I'm talking serious trouble where you cannot see beyond the point of that trouble. I see one hand. Is there anybody else? Have you ever been in trouble, real trouble? Well, I have. I had this experience some years ago. And you don't have to tell me about your troubles. That's fine. I just want to know if you've been in trouble. All right? But I hope you can relate to what I'm about to say. 
Now, I had this dream one night that I was driving. And I was driving through this town, this busy town, and a little girl darted in front of the vehicle. And the vehicle hit her. And it was such a terrifying dream. It felt so real. I woke up immediately traumatized by the experience because it was so real. What if I tell you that a few months after that, the dream became a reality? That as I was driving through one of the most dangerous towns in Jamaica, a little girl dashed across the road. And I was able to see her just in the nick of time to swerve a little bit. But she still was hit by the car. Not the front, but the side. That was one of the most traumatic and terrifying experiences of my life. I was confused, I was discombobulated, I don't know where I was, I don't know what was happening, I panicked so badly, I just couldn't bring myself to be present in the moment to even react in a way that was helpful. But anyways, some persons ran towards the situation and we took the car, we took the, the little girl, we put her in the car, and I drove to the hospital with her. And as we were driving, as I was driving, I, I don't know, but I don't think I was driving. It must have been Jesus who was driving because my mind was not present. And I kept praying, I kept praying, I kept praying, and took her to the hospital. And they took her and rushed her into the emergency. And suddenly, about three women, I think, three or four just came around me and grabbed onto me and started to pray. Started to pray, started to pray as though they were calling down the angels from heaven. And all my fears and anxieties subsided. I started to feel again peace. And I went to the police station to give a statement and a report about the incident. And the, the sergeant that I was dealing with said to me immediately, you know, normally we would have seized the vehicle. But he said, I'm not going to seize the vehicle today. I'm going to let you go. And he let me go. And he would call me about an hour after to say, it's a good thing that you went because a mob descended on the station to ask, where was the guy? And they came with all manner of weapons. It's an area that you don't want to get yourself into trouble in that place. And I saw that how uh, on that day I could have, not only could that little girl have lost her life, but I also could have lost my life. And even if that little girl, even if I didn't lose my life, in that situation, I could have ended up in prison for having been responsible for taking that little girl's life. And I learned the peace of God in, a, in such a profound way. I remember the prayer to that time I was someone you could regard as a warrior. I worried if, if there was anything that could go wrong, I would think of what could go wrong. You know Murphy's Law? If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. And the Lord taught me in, those, in, in, in that time not to worry. Since that year, it happened in the year 2006, I have not really known what it is to worry. Because I've come to the conclusion that if God cannot take care of it, it cannot be taken care of. 
And if God is in control of my life, and if the scripture stands true that says all things work for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, then I know that I have absolutely nothing to worry about. David says, if I make my bed in hell, even there you are. For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I've learned a level of trust in God that can only come from personal experience of seeing the power of God at work, of God taking your situation and handling it for you. And that's not the only miracle I can tell you about. Or if you do not believe in miracle, I am a living miracle standing before you right here and now. I know the power of God and therefore I know the peace of God. When we are at peace with God and have the peace of God, we are not prone to be frantic, confused, and anxious, but instead we are able to maintain a sound mind because of the relationship that we have with the Prince of Peace. We know that the battle is the Lord's and we do not even have to fight at times but Jesus just let the Lord have his way because Jehovah Shalom who is our peace is also Jehovah Nissi the Lord who is our victory and our banner As faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, we know that if we have had to fight for a while, but have reached the end of our ropes, and where there, 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 are, there is no more fight left in us, Jehovah Shalom, who is also Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts, who is our strong tower, will always be present with us. We know that God will fight the battle for us in the hour of our greatest need. No matter what that need is, whether it is a need for finances, a need for health, a need for relationship, whatever the circumstance or the challenge might be, whatever the need might be, God promises to supply all our needs according to God's riches in glory. Let me say this, my friends, that when we have faith, there is no need for worry. Faith takes away worry. Those of us who worry or those of us who trust not God to do what God says that God will do. For if God says that God will do it, it will be done. For as Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away before one drop of my word shall pass away. My word shall accomplish what it has been sent forth to accomplish, according to the prophet Isaiah, and shall not return to me empty or void. Do you believe that today? The same God who said, let there be, and there was, is the same God who is saying to us, trust my word. For where there is trust in my word, there is peace. You know, I remember there were times in the past where my wife would be angry at me because when things are challenging or whenever there is a situation that requires some kind of energy above the norm I would just be there cool and easy she'd be wondering why are you so cool and easy shouldn't you be all concerned I said I am concerned but I'm also confident because concern does not erase confidence. I am confident that the outcome will be in our favor. 
I don't know what that looks like because sometimes she wants the answer. What does that look like? I don't know what that looks like. But I know what it will be. And it will be that God will make it to work in our favor. And can I tell you something, my friends? God has never disappointed me. I don't know about you, but God has never let me down. Whenever there is any letting down or disappointment, I am the one letting down and disappointing God. When I fail to be patient, when I fail to be trusting, when I fail to rest in peace. I'm going to hasten on because I have to stop. Now there's something else I want to say about peace. The thing about peace is that we pray for peace and we desire peace in the way that speaks to the external corporate expression of peace. Where we are not at each other's throat, where we are not killing each other, where there are no wars or conflict. Where we live in harmony and we live in goodwill toward each other. Where we think about each other the way we would have others think about us. Where we do unto others only what we would have them do unto us. But might I suggest that that kind of peace is not possible except that there is peace on the inside. Because you know who always fights? Those who are miserable. You know who always quarrels? Those who are miserable. You know who is always seeking conflict and stirring up trouble? Those who are miserable. For when there is wholeness, remember I said that the word peace, it means wholeness. When there is completeness on the inside, when there is contentment on the inside, when there is soundness on the inside, when there is a spirit of friendship on the inside. Remember I said that peace means all of those things? Whenever that exists on the inside, it has a way of manifesting on the outside. And I don't want you to disturb my peace. Because if I start a war, then my peace is going to be disturbed. I enjoy my peace. If I start a conflict, then my peace is going to be disturbed. If I start a quarrel, then my peace is going to be disturbed. If I start any kind of trouble, then my peace is going to be disturbed. And I don't want my peace to be disturbed. So those of us who experience peace on the outside are peacemakers. We seek peace and we pursue it. And as far as, as scripture says, as far as it depends on us, we strive to be at peace with all people. May peace at last come to the world, even as we each find peace on the inside and allow that peace to be manifested on the outside. That's why Jesus came, to give us wholeness, completeness, soundness, welfare, tranquility, contentment, and friendship. My peace I give to you, he says. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled.